Good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to thank the IIAS for organizing my talk this morning and to everyone here for making it to my talk. My presentation today is based on a chapter from a book that I'm writing titled Labor of Love and has been in development for the past four years. I will be sharing with you um, some ethnographic vignettes from my fieldwork and how they have informed my understanding of the speciality of Malay print romance. So it was easy to miss Sheikh Ted in the crowd, an unassuming woman of modest stature and dress in her orange colored hijab. She did not immediately strike one as a successful best-selling author of romantic stories beloved by thousands of readers. Yet she commands a crowd of women who have come to see her. At one end of a long queue, she leans against a tall reception table, signing her books at the annual International Book Fair in Kuala Lumpur. Admirers of her fans uh, come bearing gifts, soft toys, bouquets of flowers, and other tokens enclosed within small decorative gift boxes. Meeting Chet Ted was less a moment of gift giving than of gift exchange in return for writing books that have brought much enjoyment and the restoration of feeling. This was a program highlight every year of Chet Ted's publisher in their 14 days at the annual book fair. On one occasion, she offers her signature to two fans who wear the niqab, one of whom covered in military camouflage print. They have taken much delight in her latest novel, an emotional story of forced marriage that blossoms into romantic love. The book signing was an event that brought text, reader, and author together in one place. Both women were equally keen to meet Chaitde, drawn as they were to her modest persona and impressive personal story of social mobility, assisted in no small part by her publisher. Before she enjoyed the micro-celebrity of Malay romance authorship, Chit Ted had worked as a cashier in a supermarket and before that in a factory. She had only published her first novel in 2016, but within two years, she became a best-selling author with film and television adaptations to her name. Her rapid ascent to fame and success is remarkable given her humble working class background and the absence of connections, formal training and publishing history. Her writing career began after quitting paid work to be a full-time housewife. Publishing opportunity and success came at a propitious timing for her and her publisher. She had submitted her first manuscript to them when the latter had been in business for only a few months. As an unpublished, writer, she lacked the confidence to approach more established publishers, and a smaller, independent publisher seemed much more approachable. Chit Dead's social mobility from factory floor to successful author demonstrates the significance of place and space. Since her quick rise to small-scale literary stardom, Chit Dead has transformed into an affluent woman with a large following in the tens of thousands. Like many wealthy individuals with a public profile in Malaysia, she dignifies her persona with charitable work, primarily food donations to the needy, along with free copies of her novels. She eschews the lifestyle of the newly rich and prefers to dress in self-effacing in an inconspicuous baju kurung, a traditional tunic, and long skirt. Her work and career mirror a new type of intimacy and subjectivity produced by global capital. She uses material lifted from her own former life as a factory operator. Her novels typically revolve around the lives of women who work in a factory. Writing from a place of working class experience, she stands apart from her more academically accomplished peers and their extensively researched 
romance fiction. Readers strongly identify with her working class persona, as many themselves hail from a similar background. And her stories about domestic conflict, full of fiery, realistic dialogue, appeal to women who seek an articulation of a similar affective fallout in their own lives. How did Chick Dead make the special spatial transition from factory floor to the page? What connects the making and disseminating of Malay popular romance with the production of place and space? My presentation today is about how Malay romance is made possible by the relations of production and the production of space across interlocking levels of, or scales, local, national, and global. It concerns the scalar spatial transition from factory floor to the page by working class Malay women who, as mobile subjects, are mobilized by state-sponsored affirmative action, neoliberalism, and global manufacturing industry. By linking romance with space and mobility, the implications of scale on the production of intimacy can be better understood. The notion of scale establishes connections between and within spatial levels and draw our attention to the ways, and I quote here, its consequences are inscribed in and are the outcomes of both everyday life and the macro level social structures, unquote. Furthermore, attention to scale highlights, I quote again, the embodiment of social relations of empowerment and disempowerment and the arena through which and in which they operate, Un unquote. The book fair is more than just a social space for bookish women. They are the other spaces, other places within hegemonic spaces, the heterotopias. Uh, within places and landscapes of racialized political dominance. Heterotopia was a term used originally to describe anatomical abnormalities, parts of the body that appear in other places, displaced or missing. Indeed, when they are present, they signify a reordering and an overall effect of incongruity, the assemblage of things that do not usually go together. Foucault's novel yet slippery concept of heterotopia is more instructive as a method of analysis than object, for he was interested in illuminating the extraordinary in mundane places, seeing them as spaces that are assigned multiple, often contrasting and incompatible meanings. He identified a seemingly incongruous array of places as representative of heterotopias, the garden, the rest home, the mental asylum, brothel, the ship, and Turkish baths. These are places where life can be experienced differently depending on one's relation to structural power. Heterotopias are much more than geographical places. Rather, they are sites of relationality, defined by what they perform in relation to other sites. Never existing in isolation, they are spaces of overcompensation in response to their surroundings, doing more beyond its, and I quote Foucault here, role to create a space that is other, another real space as perfect, as meticulous, as well arranged, as ours is messy, ill constructed, and jumbled, unquote. Such spaces allow for the slice of time, decoupage du temps, that suggests the cutting out of time, of being out of time. To be in place in a cemetery is to break with time. It is where time is frozen, but also accumulated. These characteristics make quotidian heterotopias a space for and of imagination. As I will discuss in my talk today, public spaces for the dissemination of books are heterotopias insofar as they allow for temporary slices of time their temporality having a disproportionate quality that completely reconfigures spatial social relations as we shall see in this background image. At the book fair, I learned that place brought together in great numbers, readers, publishers, and authors from all across the country. But there were other places where popular romance thrived that tell us a lot about race relations 
and culture in Malaysia. Ethnic claims to land, space, and place are intertwined through history and are typically retold as origin myths that whitewash division, imperialism, and supremacy of one group over others. Such spaces are also heterotopias for the production of popular intimacy, where incongruous and incompatible meanings are held in productive tension, where relations of production and consumption meet. They occupy the in-between spaces of masculine, racialized power and global manufacturing. And the other place is Mrs. Harmida and Mrs. Zanaria's romance bookshop in Banda Baru, Bangi. Bangi is a microcosm of modern Malaysia and a palimpsest of sorts, continually recast by layers of colonial industry and its afterlife, an industrializing recent past, and a modern religious ethnoscape in the present. Bangi was one of the jewels of the Southeast Asian tiger's crown. On the margins of Bangi, Japanese electronics manufacturing factories established in the early years of the Look East policy under the fourth Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad still stand today but have lost their shine. A casual visitor to Bangi will quickly encounter impressive Mac mansions in gated communities in clusters of shop houses mounted with huge billboards advertising luxury prayer garments and hijab, and a, an outcome of decades-long accumulation of ethno-religious capital and resources. A large golf course next to a four-star hotel close to the landmark university campus complete the town's image as a playground for the newly rich. These places, signal ostentatious wealth and prestige for an ethnic majority group that redefined its political and economic destiny, first as an expression of self-determination, then later as racial difference. Balancing worldly affluence is the outsized expression of Islamic architecture scattered around the town, Nestled between the neat rows of more modest middle-class terraces and standalone bungalows are the many large prayer halls that rival the grandeur of mosques. A grand Sharia court is situated at the heart of Bangi's commercial centre. Perched on its roof is the royal blue and white crisscrossed dome reminiscent of the iconic Shah Alam blue mosque in the state capital of Selangor. By mimicking a mosque, the Sharia courthouse of Bangi blurs the architectural boundaries of buildings made for worship and legal arbitration. Here, buildings of Islamic public life should look like mosques. Bangi was the location of the first rubber plantation in the state of Slangol, called the West Country Estate, founded in 1905. The town itself was founded a year later in 1906 with the construction of 18 Malay shops selling, among other things, men's fast hats, slippers, opium, and coffee. The replacement of the rubber economy with global manufacturing during Malaysia's period of modernization was the remaking of Bangi. Japanese companies, Sony and Hitachi, opened their electronics manufacturing factories in the town drawing working-class Malay women workers to their assembly lines. It also signaled the end of Malaysia's agricultural era. Between 1972 and 1978, West Country Estate was reclaimed by the Slango government to be redeveloped but for the settlement of newly formed Malay middle class as part of the new economic plan's mission to eradicate poverty by accelerating the social mobility of the historically impoverished Malay population. The, the colonial legacy of Bangi as a rubber plantation can be traced in the few structures that remain. In West Country stands the only Tamil language school in a township crowded with Islamic and Malay language schools and colleges. It is a primary school for children raised by descendants of South Indian migrant laborers brought in by the British destined to work in the plantations like their parents and ancestors before them, they were not expected to go any further beyond primary education. And thus, 
a, sec a Tamil secondary school was never built. Today, West Country is home to working class ethnic Indians and Malays, and it is one of the most deprived parts of an otherwise affluent rebuilt town. It is a place left behind by aspirational placemaking. In 1978, the arrival of new settlers of approximately 150 Malay Muslim families for employment in the newly founded public research universities would replace the previous class of settlers and give them the opportunity to belong to a new land-owning class. As planned townships rebuilt from colonial foundations go, Bangi's landscape is relatively featureless, sterile, and sparsely populated. The privileging of middle-class Malay and Islamic lifestyles and livelihoods in Bangi's redevelopment have had an indirect effect on the town's slow population growth and even during the industrial boom years of the 1970s and 1980s. Bangi can seem like an unlikely place for romantic aspiration but it is home to a pioneering romance bookshop and cafe, Reader's Heaven and Coffee, co-founded by, by Mrs. Hamida and Mrs. Zanaria. The bookshop is also the location of their publishing company, Kasi Aries, an independent imprint that specializes in Malay language romantic fiction. The same one that published Chit Tet's novel that I talked about earlier. Although situated in a shopping district frequented by consumers who seek expensive hijab and prayer garments, they, however, are not the bookshop's main audience. The bookshop is a space of a different kind of class consumption, which also operates as a heterogeneous space of production. The, pu the publishing of books and the formation of new social relationships with readers it is also a space for students from universities nearby to study and have study meetings with friends. The bookshop and its cafe occupy a single L-shaped floor covering 200 square feet of space. Books line the wall on every side. In one bookcase are romance novels in English. Two large study tables take up space in the middle of the shop. Towards the end of the shop where the, where the shop bends into an L, is a coffee bar and discussion corner with four leather armchairs, two facing each other, and a coffee table between them. In this corner, the bookshop turns into a small library where all the books can be taken out for borrowing. Unlike heterotopias like museums and cemeteries that accumulate time, the romance bookshop accumulates emotion. It is a space of mixed and jointed experiences where fantasy and personal life intertwine, a place whose function is the transportation to other imagined places. The bookshop owners and publisher belong to the new generation, to the generation of the new Malays, Melayu Baru. Their location and global mobility characterized by international learning and white collar professional careerism largely unavailable to their parents of the pre-independence generation. Both Hamida and Zanaria, two sisters in their 50s, born in Malaysia, were educated in the United States, where they continued to live for many years after their studies. Hamida went on to marry an American man who has moved back to Malaysia with her. Their relative wealth and social capital are uh, are an advantage in literary entrepreneurship. As independent publishers, they manage the vertical production of co book cover design to the marketing of books in shops and annual book fairs, including the Kuala Lumpur International Book Fair. Not far from the romance bookshop are the electronics factories. Work opportunities in the manufacturing industries in places like Bangi attract young single women from out of state rural parts of the peninsula to move and settle close to the urban centers of Selangor and Kuala Lumpur. Because women have historically worked alongside men in Malay village society, the quest for work opportunity outside the home was actually encouraged um, by the single woman's family. Economic migration for these women also liberate them from the social control of male guardianship in their village. 
making them free to establish new social networks and lifestyle in their new surrounding environment. They were women who made the migration from rural to urban places. Their mobility entailed a new spatialized subjectivity that came with its own set of cultural assumptions. However, as the anthropologist Ai Hua Ong has noted, the city and the factory were far from liberating spaces for women. They occupy a lowly position in the, on the assembly line, overseen by layers of male surveillance and management. Outside the factory, they face scrutiny of their sexual morality on account of their youth and unmarried working class status. Mobile subjectivity creates conditions for the practice of Malay romance. Through mobility, women have transformed from being objects of industrial relations and production into subjects of affective relations and production. Many keen readers of romance have moved to Kuala Lumpur for higher education and work, living in rented accommodation with housemates away from their family. The city opens up an unprecedented possibilities of intimacy. Moving back to small town and village life is not an option for many of these women. Their trajectory is forward oriented rather than backwards. So it's further weakening of traditional ties in whose place are replaced by modern social formations. Settling in urban and suburban communities means building nuclear families and relying less on the resources of extended family relations that are much more typical in rural communities. I would argue that mobility makes new intimacies possible. It makes romance possible. Following the modernization of the public sphere, women's mobility in particular makes the associated emotional resources and practices such as care, intimacy, and romantic love available as an option on women's terms. Mobility creates conditions for the work of romance. And this is my closing point. More closely aligned with Bangi's moral aspirations are the heirs of the Dakwa movement. Inspired by the Islamic revolution in Iran in 1979, young educated Malays sought greener Islamic pastures and flew abroad to find transnational kindred spirits. On their return, their influence on university campuses were visible. Educated women took up the all enveloping hijab to distinguish themselves from the nominal expression of Islam prevalent in the populace. They distanced themselves from the working class sexuality of factory women. However, a few decades later, places like the romance bookshop and the book fair allow for the effective harmony of interclass mobile spatialized subjectivities. They share similar aspirations and desires and they will seek places that take them to other places of imagination and fantasy. Their modes of space making, spaces carved out of established places of racial exclusion are mobilized to produce a kind of scene where individuals will travel to, to meet and reestablish social bonds and expand networks. But as a place, the romance bookshop is more than a meeting site. Um, for like-minded enthusiasts. The Romance Bookshop in Bangi is one such place that holds this tension together. It is a place of production and consumption, desire and constraint, where mixed and jointed experiences of learning, religiosity and pleasure can be found. It is a heterotopia, a place of reorder. Thank you for listening.